So you should be seeing it now. So an empty side in a stenosis or a full arch augmentation um, from a stenotomy approach. So same concepts apply here. Apologies, I'm somehow too late to stop the video on time. Um, so this is a more extreme form of tubular hyperplasia of the aortic arch. Um, in association with coarctation of the aorta. And uh, you see that the arrows pointing again at that typical segment that I've been mentioning now multiple times that uh, this is not going to be sufficiently uh, addressed with an extended end-to-end -end repair. And therefore, you need to enlarge your aortic arch more aggressively. Um, um, so otherwise, the anatomy is fairly uh, similar. And uh, from a surgical perspective, the primary setup is that you're um, uh, uh, that you're um, starting your procedure by putting the patient on pump and initiate cooling, um, and then uh, you get uh, use the time while you're uh, cooling to dissect everything out, um, and get access to your supraortic uh, branches uh, and control them with snares usually. Um, so um, the way I've been taught that uh, is um, to use basically a direct open cannulation of the innominate artery with an, um, a little cannula to perfuse the brain for selective cerebral perfusion. But um, I've recently uh, been taught by David how to start with uh, basically anastomosing a, a shunt to the innominate artery, which is very convenient as well. Uh, so. Um, not part of the procedure in the models, but um, it is something that uh, you should be considering thinking about these repairs, so how to basically get to a stage where you can actively start um, uh, augmenting your arch and um, think of how you would, uh, you know, what you need and how you set yourself up to, uh, to get there. Um, you certainly need control of the superaortic vessels so that you can occlude them. Um, and then uh, you can um, divide your duct and um, uh, occlude your descending aorta as well as you start repairing. Um, if it's uh, just hypoplasia, uh, but continuity of the um, aorta and not an interruption, you don't have to cannulate your um, arterial duct um, so uh, to ensure lower body perfusion. Um, so from that perspective, you can just start um, basically perfusing your um, uh, ascending aorta. And once you're uh, tying off the duct and you're cooled appropriately and you have um, everything in place, you can divide the duct. Um, there are different options on how to address uh, basically the distal end of your aortic arch. So um, what I've been doing uh, uh, quite frequently um, is to tie off the distal end, uh, basically and suture ligate it, and then do a separate incision in the uh, transverse arch. Here in the model, I've basically just divided the ductal area, again, with resection of suspicious looking ductal tissue, if you so will. And then um, you can um, uh, incise the aortic arch um, longitudinally, similar like what you've seen in the um, thoracotomy um, uh, extended end-to-end -end repair. Um, you have to make sure that you're uh, uh, basically following the aortic arch appropriately. And I think uh, one mistake that you could do is uh, to be tricked into making this incision too short. Um, because you basically think that your augmentation only needs to be the aortic arch itself uh, and the ascending aorta is already looking fairly decent in size. While that may be true, you surely want to augment far into a segment that is healthy and adequately large to ensure that you're not leaving obstruction. So usually you have to go a bit deeper into your ascending aorta than you would um, uh, initially think. And then we start uh, usually in deep hypothermic circulatory arrest um, to anastomose the descending aorta to the end of the um, uh, transverse arch. Um, this can be done with the clamp off 
if there's uh, you know complete arrest, then you should not have a lot of blood filling up your field, and it's usually a bit more convenient and easier to expose if you do that uh, while in deep hypothermic arrest before then initiating selective cerebral perfusion after the completion of that partial anastomosis. And then um, you're anastomosing basically the posterior wall of your descending aorta and the posterior wall of your uh, transverse arch. Uh, and I usually um, run this posterior suture line uh, quite a bit into the uh, transverse arch so, so that it almost flattens out the descending aorta to some extent. You'll see we'll do a similar um, additional incision in the descending aorta at a later stage that then um, allows us to augment the uh, descending aorta further. I'm here just to get around the uh, posterior circumference and then you're incising uh, basically uh, allows two things at once. So one is to basically cut through, if at all, uh, uh, some residual ductal tissue, but also to allow uh, the patch augmentation beyond the actual um, uh, level of the uh, posterior wall anastomosis. And then uh, most of the time uh, I would use autologous pericardium treated with glutaraldehyde um, to augment the aortic arch. Um, so if you have a more or less rectangular shape of your, um, um, of your pericardium, I start with a bit of a rounded tip and basically just shape that very proximal segment of it. Uh, and then usually you want to have a little bit of an angle to it to accommodate the um, uh, the curvature of the aortic arch. Um, but it's also a bit of um, judging how big your anastomosis might be. So um, for me, this distance is usually the distance from my incision in the descending aorta to the level of the uh, posterior wall anastomosis. And then basically at the level where it meets that previously, uh, the end of the previously placed suture in the lesser curvature of the arch, then you start to have that angle uh, towards the ascending aorta. So I'm roughly judging there, I'm, I have to admit in the, the model, I was not 100% happy with the shape of that uh, patch uh, on that um, silicone uh, patch, but um, uh, you'll see it uh, comes out quite nicely nonetheless. So uh, you start with a few sutures at the uh, basically very end of that uh, incision in the descending aorta and then run this up. Um, and then you're pretty much out of that hole at the basically towards the descending aorta. You can uh, switch to selective cerebral perfusion. Usually you're in a time frame of 15 to 20 minutes there. Uh, so that should be a fairly safe time span. And then um, you're running that suture up to until it meets your previously placed um, stitch. I usually triple that stitch. So you may have seen that I uh, use descending aorta, aortic arch and the patch with one bite um, to make sure that this uh, is uh, fairly um, sealed. Typical place for a little bleeder there. And then uh, same here, you're running it all up on the superior end and meet the other suture line as well. That's a time point where you can adjust the angle. Usually I would have a bit more of an angle here. Um, and then um, you run that suture line further. As you're covering more anterior, the placement of these sutures becomes much easier. Exposure is much easier. Um, so that's where you can certainly uh, gain a little bit in time. And then um, what I usually do uh, at that time as well is you can uh, uh, remove uh, the clamp on the descending aorta that I would have placed again once I've initiated selective cerebral perfusion and see how basically the backflow from the descending aorta uh, lifts up your patch and uh, um, creates basically um, uh, the hypothetical um, shape of the uh, filled aorta. Uh, and that can guide you in terms of how uh, you shape your patch accordingly.
and then you run your suture line further there, right into the ascending aorta. Good time to then uh, de-air and tie it up. And then you see how you're, you've enlarged your uh, aortic arch. We'll have a picture with uh, basically the um, aorta distended a bit better. Um, so that uh, shows how it's kind of augmenting your arch accordingly. All right, so these are the two repairs. Um, and I'm obviously open again for questions. <laughs>